thank you very, very much, Ari, for the kind invitation and uh, really for that lovely introduction. And I am very happy to be able to present Pauline Museum to this group. And I want to thank everybody for taking the time on a Sunday uh, in the afternoon. I'm assuming the weather is beautiful and there are many other things you could be doing. So thank you so much for uh, for being here today. Also, I'm delighted to know that that several of you have been to Poli Museum, and I am hoping that many more of you will plan to go. We will be commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising on April 19th with a very, very special program of events uh, and a special temporary exhibition on the experience of Jewish civilians in the, in the ghetto during the uprising. And the, a year later, there will be an exhibition dedicated and based on the memories and paintings of my father who grew up in Poland during the 1920s and 30s. And that's gonna be very special as well. So there are many reasons to come and that, that's basically what we can expect in 2023 and 2024. So curating between hope and despair, one of the things I wanted to do today was, well, first of all, I really wanna take you behind the scenes so that you really get a sense not only of what is Pauline Museum and what is the core exhibition, but you get a sense of how we created it, why we made it the way that we did. So that's the first thing. It's a, a kind of curators behind the scenes tour. But the second is that I would like to pose several questions and I'd like to invite you to, as you're thinking about these questions during the talk, to feel free to add your comments to the chat. So why was it so important to create this museum? Uh, and it, it faces the monument of the ghetto heroes. And what accounts for its extraordinary success? What impact is it having? And how is it addressing current crises? And last but not least, what makes Jewish museums in Europe seem more urgent and often more interesting than Jewish museums elsewhere, for example, the United States. I would be very, very interested in your thoughts on that. So we opened the doors of the building in 2013 and we opened the, the core exhibition in 2014. And that, we can, that year and that opening in October, of 2014, we consider that our grand opening. And Arnie Eisen, who was then the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, he attended and shortly thereafter, he wrote this statement, which I found extraordinary. It's not often that a museum makes history as well as chronicles it. And rare too, when otherwise cautious observers remark at the opening of a new museum, that it may prove a source of hope and pride that propels an entire society, society forward. Both of those things happened this week in Warsaw with the opening of Pauline Museum. So in a way, that sounds like an answer to some of our questions, but I think in a, looking closely at the museum, we can, we can make our answers more specific. So the very first thing we have to, oh, I hope this will work. Just a second. Aha. Uh -huh. So the very first question is, where is it? Pauline Museum is, stands on the rubble of the former Warsaw Ghetto and former pre-war Jewish neighborhood. After the, after the Germans suppressed the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, they simply raised the area and they left an ocean of rubble. And this rubble took several years to clear. And once it was cleared, or as it was being cleared, the, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, as it was being cleared, even while it was being cleared, uh, there was the unveiling of a monument to the ghetto heroes. And you can see it sitting on top of the rubble. And in the background, you can see the destroyed old city of Warsaw. So the idea was to simply demoralize the, the Polish people by destroying what was for them the greatest treasure, which is the old city. So the, the monument to the ghetto heroes was unveiled on the fifth anniversary of the uprising. Uh, and it was really an extraordinary moment. Today, of course, this area, the rubble has been cleared, the communist era apartment blocks surround it. There's a plaza, 
And for many, many years, the only public sign that Jews once lived here and the Jews died here was this monument. And to this day, it is the icon of the story of the Jews of Warsaw and the story of Polish Jews. So it was our feeling that with the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Washington in 1993, that if, and this was um, the idea of a member of the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute, which is an NGO that was a Jewish NGO that was established in Warsaw in 1951. And uh, Grzyna Pavlak uh, was at the opening of the Holocaust Museum in DC. And she said, if there is a museum of the Holocaust in DC, in the capital of the United States, there should be a museum of the history of Polish Jews in the capital of Poland, in Warsaw. And in 1993, that was just an idea. And it was a project until it was realized finally, and the doors opened in 2003 and 2014. So quite soon, the mayor of Warsaw said, well, if by some miracle this museum will be built, it should be built, or, or rather he approved the idea that it should be built facing the monument to the ghetto heroes. And as you can see here, the monument, in its time, it was monumental. But today, as monuments go, it's rather, I would say, it's, it's rather modest, but it is absolutely iconic. Now, the, so, the, so this, this area was allocated by the city of Warsaw. And as a result of an architectural competition, this building was created by the Finnish architect, Rainer Mahlamaki. Now the architects that get the second prize, the third prize, they say why that's a great prize is because you get the prize and you don't have to build it. But Rainer and Daniel Liebeskind was among them. But this is a wonderful building. And what's so extraordinary about it is that it meets the requirements of the international competition, which is that it should be modest. It should echo the geometry of the building. It should stand in a respectful relationship to the building. And it should, um, in a way, communicate what this museum is all about. And what you see here is a building that is actually clad in glass with these glass panels that have inscribed on them in Hebrew letters and in Latin letters, the word Pauline. Which, in, which is the, both the Yiddish Poland and Pauline, the Yiddish and Hebrew word for Poland. And of course, there are many legends about that word. So the, what, you, what you have here is a glass building. And I like to think of this building as an architecture of hope on a site of tragedy, and that it is communicating in the medium of glass, which is reflective and transparent and open. That's the, that's, the, that's the big message of this building. And this is the side that faces the park. It's the largest glass window in Poland. And it is not, it is suspended actually. It's not, it's not uh, attached in some other way. The architect created a big contrast bet between the exterior, that lovely glass exterior uh, of the, the building that reflects, that's open and transparent. And the interior where you see all this drama of these curvilinear shapes that are inspired by the canyons of the Judean desert, its sandiness, the Mediterranean, in a way, the people of the Bible, which is an idea that appealed to him very, very much. And it's a spectacular interior, but a wonderfully modest exterior. And the relationship between the two, I think is really, really powerful. Now, the rubble is a good metaphor for us because it means that we really didn't start with an historical building. We didn't start with an intact neighborhood. We didn't start with a collection. We started with a story. And it is the thousand year story of the history of Polish Jews. And I say Polish Jews and not Jews in Poland because the history of Polish Jews is much wider than the borders of Poland at any point in time. And that is that most, if you will, Polish Jews today are not living in Poland. And historically, they emigrated, whether it was during the great emigration of the late 19th century, they're living in Israel, in North America, Australia, Melbourne, especially, South Africa. 
they are living in many places. And it is important for us to think of Polish Jews in that global sense. So what the architect did was he gave us the footprint of the building to create the core exhibition. So when you are in the museum, you are on the main floor and then you walk down uh, a very grand staircase. And when you walk down this staircase, you will come into the core exhibition. Now, the since we did not begin with a collection, although we did form and we have been forming a collection, we have probably now about 1400 objects. We determined that even if we had access to all the objects in the world that have a relationship to the history of Polish Jews, we would not be able to tell this story and if effectively through objects alone or even primarily through objects. And in a way, we were blessed because had we had a very rich collection, in a way, we would have been obliged to use the collection to tell the story. On the other hand, we were cursed because we didn't have the objects that we needed to support the story we wanted to tell. And so the, the, the approach that we took was what I call a theater of history. That is to work as if the exhibition were a theater in three dimensions, 360 degrees, and where you are, the visitor, are kind of actor that as you walk, the plot unfolds. It's kind of, you could say it's environmental theater or theater of the mise-en-scene or still life theater. So this is a really lovely example of how we create a setting within which we tell the story and we make the space a narrator of the story. And I'll show you some other techniques that we've used. This is a, the moment in the, in the late 18th century where the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was partitioned by Austria and Prussia and Russia. Now, of course, we did use objects, but there were most of the objects that, that exist are from the 19th and 20th centuries, paintings, memorabilia, photographs, Judaica, but not what we would need to tell a story that spans a thousand years from the 10th century to the present. So a very quick timeline, the, this is the, the, the museum was created as a private public partnership. It was initiated by the Jewish NGO, the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute of Poland. And it was a project until the association uh, convinced the city of Warsaw and the Ministry of Culture to join in a three partner partnership to actually found the museum. So the idea was 93 and we worked on the exhibition for four years in order, it, mainly because we didn't have the money to do anything else. But I actually think that because this museum was created from the inside out, it's a better museum rather than the way that most museums are created is that first they make the building and then they try to figure out what to put in it. And we worked in the exact opposite way. And that is first we, envisioned and and I would say planned the exhibition and then we had the architectural competition so it was very unusual to plan or to work from the inside out so we had the master plan for the exhibition the museum was founded there was the competition we opened the building the grand opening and as of 221 which means Already during COVID, we had 4 million visitors a year. Oh no, we've had 4 million visitors uh, from the opening until now. And that of course includes the drop in visitors during COVID. So one of the things that I think is very important and I think that gives this, this exhibition a lot of intellectual coherence is that we don't have what you would call a master narrative. We don't have a story where there is a plot line that the scholars, the historians have laid out and that you follow. We have an open narrative. I would say that our approach is that the past is open and that we work with a set of historical or meta-historical principles. And those principles are a key to the messages that we hope our visitors will take away. And I'll only, uh, I'll only mention a few of the ones on this list. The first 
is an answer to the question, what is the most important period in the history of Polish Jews? And most people say the Holocaust. And, or they, they may say the interwar years, or they may say the post-war years. And what we say is the most important period in the history of Polish Jews is 1,000 years, all of it, absolutely all of it. The second is that Jews are an integral part of the history of Poland, that they're not only in Poland, but they're also of Poland, that this is a story of coexistence and conflict, cooperation and competition, separation and integration, that Jews created a civilization that is, in the words of Moshe Rossman, categorically Jewish and distinctly Polish, and in some cases, more accurately, Belarusian, Lithuanian, and Ukrainian, because the territory at some points included those other areas. That Jews, Polish Jews became the largest Jewish community in the world and a center of the Jewish world. In the 18th century, half the Jews of the world lived in the territory of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, 750,000 Jews, half the Jewish population of the world. And so these are among the meta historical principles that guided our narrative and that we hope our visitors will take away with them. So now I will give you a relatively brief walk through the core exhibition and will highlight some of the ways in which we crafted our theater of history and what makes it so unusual, so different from any other history museum you'll encounter. So when you come down that grand set of stairs from the main floor, you actually come into a big, big open space from the bottom of the building all the way up to the roof and it's dedicated to a forest. This is a multimedia forest projected on glass, and it is the, the setting for the story of how the legend the Jews told themselves about how they came to Poland and why they stayed. And we use the telling of the legend by Shin Agnon, the Nobel Prize winner, the Hebrew, the wonderful Hebrew writer, who was in fact born in what is today Ukraine, um, and who uh, was, was living in Israel. So the story basically, very simply, is that, that Jews fled persecution in Western Europe, they fled East, they came to a forest, and then they heard the words Pauline, which they thought were Hebrew words, and they understood them to mean, here you shall rest, here you shall dwell. And they said, and we will stay here, until the prophet Elijah um, comes and blows the shofar and takes us to the promised land. Now, there are many versions of the legend, but we thought it was very counterintuitive to begin a thousand year history of Polish Jews with a story that Jews told themselves about how they came. And we think it's probably a 19th century legend, but that was how we wanted to start. When we enter the medieval gallery, we cross the threshold between legend and history. Now, the medieval gallery begins in the 10th century, and it ends around 1500. In other words, more than half of the thousand-year history of Polish Jews is in the medieval period, more than half. And for that 500-year period, we have exactly two kinds of artifacts for telling that story, tombstones and coins. This tombstone is the oldest uh, Jewish tombstone from the region. It's from the 13th century, from Wrocław, uh, what was Breslau. And the coins, there are these incredible coins, many of them one-sided coins, they're called bracteates that have Hebrew inscriptions on them because some Jews were given a privilege or permission to mint coins or to supervise the minting of coins, and they would include a blessing on them, bracha v'hatzlacha, or the name of the king, or the name of the minter. Now, how do you create a story from such objects? What we did was we went to medieval Ashkenazi illuminated manuscripts from the Rhineland, we took two comic book artists that are very famous in Poland, and we said to them, illustrate the story and do so in a style 
appropriate to the period across the 500 years. And the result is a completely handmade, hand painted, hand gilded gallery. And we consider this multimedia, only this time it's analog. And so the result is the feeling that you are in a, an illuminated manuscript that is life size, 360 degrees. And the story that we tell in this 500 year period is, how is it that a few Jewish, from a few Jewish traveling merchants in the 10th century, we have Jewish communities, approximately 100 places Jews have settled, about 50 of them in actual Jewish communities. How did that happen? over the course of 500 years. And this gallery attempts to tell that story and to illuminate the process by which a few traveling, a few traveling Jewish merchants in the 10th century results in this, uh, uh, the forming of these Jewish communities, perhaps maybe 15,000 Jews. When we cross from the medieval gallery to the early modern period, we are in the area of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. That is the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. And we divided this into two periods, separated by the Khmelnytsky Uprising, an event of the 1640s, which was utterly devastating, traumatic for the Jews in the territory, but was part of a century of war. And the first half of the period, which is the second half of the 1500s, and it's the uh, first half of the 1600s, we try to really tell the story of the rise of Jewish civilization in the territory and how it is that Poland becomes the center of the Ashkenazi Jewish world. That center in the medieval period had been in the Rhineland in Germany. But by this time, Poland had distinguished rabbis. It had uh, world famous yeshivas. Uh, fa Jewish families in Western Europe were sending their boys to Poland to study with Polish rabbis and in Polish yeshivas. This area became a center of Jewish printing. It became a center of Jewish learning. Now, when I say a theater of history, I, I showed it to you in one way, which you could say was scenographic. But the second way is by creating a kind of play script. And that is by presenting quotations from primary sources that really give you a voice from the period. So, for example, there's a poem that was created on the occasion of a coronation, and it was by somebody very critical of everything that was going on in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which I'll show you in a moment, that territory. The Polish kingdom is paradise for the Jews, hell for the peasants, purgatory for the burghers, and rule by servants. And in this case, paradise for the Jews is a criticism. The writer of this lampoon means that Jews have it, quote, too good. But the great Rabbi Mayor Isserles, he had a different view. Their hatred of us in this country has not overwhelmed us, as in the German lands, may it remain so until the coming of our Messiah. He had obviously low expectations. But by putting these quotations together, we create a kind of chorus. We create a kind of play script for our theater of history. And this is a principle that we use all the way through. Now, this period, that is to say, from the middle of the 1500s until the end of the 1700s, this is the period of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And so Poland had already absorbed Ukraine during the medieval period. And then in the 16th century, you, uh, the, the Poland and Lithuania joined together to form a commonwealth in order to be stronger in resisting invasion from their neighbors, whether it would be the Austrian Empire or the Russian Empire. And so this is a huge territory. It's probably at the time the largest country in Europe. And so this is the territory in which we're telling our story. And it's a story of the rise of Jewish learning, which we expressed uh, in, in the form of the story of printing, the earliest printed Yiddish books were made here in Poland in the 16th century. The, the incredible story of the printed Hebrew book. We open those books up digitally so our visitors can discover what's inside them in Yiddish and in Hebrew. 
uh, we present this incredible Kabbalistic scroll that was copied by a Polish Jew by David Darshan. And then we bring our visitors into the corridor of fire. So they have come from a period of what is called, although historians think of this as something of a cliche, a golden age, both in the sense of Polish history and in Jewish history, because of Jewish, I would say, communal autonomy, and Poland as a center of Jewish religious learning. The Chmelnitsky uprising, which is a very um, complicated story, left the Polish Jewry um, absolutely devastated, and about a third of the population was either murdered or left the country, and then, of course, some returned. And it's a story that we can tell here, thanks to a document that really communicates what happened in various locations. But when we exit this corridor of fire and the story of this overwhelming event, we come to the second half of the uh, the second half of the Commonwealth period, and now we look at everyday life on the ground, not the yeshivas and not the um, I would say the rabbis and the printing, but now ordinary people. We want to look at domestic life. We want to look at the marketplace, and we want to look at religious life. So we and we want to look at women's piety and the special supplicatory prayers, the trinis that were written in some cases by women, but for women. And we're probably the only Jewish museum that has a church because we want to look at the changing relationship between the church and the Jews. And then we come to the centerpiece of this period, but also of the museum, which is the, the, the glorious wooden architecture of the wooden synagogue. And we chose the wooden synagogue in Gvozdets, which is today in Ukraine and was destroyed in World War I. And we decided that of the 200 wooden synagogues, none of which survived because the Germans burnt them all down, the single best documented one was the one that stood in Gvozdets. And so based on the documentation that was made before World War I, extraordinary architectural drawings and paintings from the 1890s by Isidore Kaufman, for example, this is actually a painting of the interior of that synagogue, we decided to work with an extraordinary educational studio called Hans House Studio. And their mission, their mission is to recover lost objects. And what they say is, you can never recover the original object in terms of its material reality, but you can recover the knowledge of how to build it by building it using traditional tools, materials, and techniques. And that's what we did with a team over, of over 300 volunteers and experts. So we went to an open air museum outside of Sanok in the south of Poland, and we brought together 200 raw logs with the bark still on. And we brought experts from the Timber Framers Guild with their historical axes and adzes and planes and with their pit saw. And we, in six weeks, we did the timber framing for the synagogue roof and for the interior painted ceiling. We then um, brought, we took it apart because it's put together with wooden pegs. And we brought all the parts to Warsaw two years later and we reassembled it and we hoisted it. It's 25 tons. And meanwhile, we did painting workshops with these students, some of whom had never picked up a paintbrush. And we painted the panels for the interior. And this is the result. And it's the most extraordinary. We also did the same thing for the Bima. And we tell the story of Jewish religious life all around this and under this extraordinary ceiling. And there's much to be said about the iconography, about the zodiac signs, and about much more. And the kids just love it. And they're like little turtles with their back cushions, and they just lie on the floor and have a look at it. And so what happens is at the end of the 18th century, those three powers, the Austrian Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Kingdom of Prussia, decide it is an opportune moment between 1772 and 1795 to divide up that huge red map and each took a piece. Russia took the biggest piece and they created, <clears throat> pardon me, two territories 
out of that biggest piece. One was called the Kingdom of Poland or Congress Poland, and the other was called the Pale of Settlement. And then there was a big piece that went to Aust the Austrian Empire. They created a special province called Galicia and another piece that went to the Kingdom of Prussia. And for approximately 120 to 140 years, Poland, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, what we know today as Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, they disappeared from the map and they were replaced. They, they in a sense, lie underneath this new configuration of the partitions. And we represent the partitioning of, the, of Poland with the three, the three monarchs and kings. And that is to say, the two kings and Catherine the Great. Now, this is a story of Jewish encounters with, the, with modernity. And that means that Jews in these territories now had to contend with efforts to reform their way of life. Changes in marriage age, dress code, role of the rabbi, conscription into the army, education, language, and we explore those challenges. We also explore Jewish responses, the Jewish enlightenment, the rise of the modern yeshiva, which we have done by creating this extraordinary film with live actors, and, and we develop the sonography in the studio, and then we have the actors and we painted them. There are only probably six of them, but they're repeated all the way through. Uh, with the miracle, of course, uh, animation. And we brought the rabbi from New York. Um, and we take our visitors then through these three responses, which are Jewish enlightenment, the modern yeshiva, and the rise of Hasidism into the train station where change really, really picks up. And it's in that context that we look at the rise of modern Hebrew and Yiddish culture and new Jewish political and social movements. Uh, there, there are many, many other aspects of this very complex period, but I only wanted to briefly signal them. We then, um, at, at the end of the 19th century, the 19th century ends with World War I. And World War I brings about the end of those empires. There's no more, no more Ottoman Empire, no more Russian Empire. Uh, the, as far as uh, Prussia is concerned, there's Germany. It's a different story. There's no more Austrian Empire, which means that now in the 19, after 1918, you now have the rise of these independent countries. You now have the rise of Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus, and the Second Polish Republic. So the Second Polish Republic is a story of the 1920s and 30s. It's the period where my father grew up. It's the period of my mother, where my mother grew up as well. And although it was only 20 years, it was an extraordinary period. There was, of course, terrible hardship. There was recovering from the war, from destruction, from devastation, migration, hunger, disease, economic, economic catastrophe. But despite, and also rising anti-Semitism, but despite all of those obstacles, there was a flourishing of Jewish culture. Uh, and I'll suggest, and so what we've done is to organize this period as a street, we call it what's doing on the Jewish street, meaning what's going on in the Jewish world. And we divided this area into four thematic areas, culture, politics, growing up, and everyday life. And and because it's it's 20 years, the, the chrono to, to do it in a strictly chrono chronological way, which we do is a, a, a here, we do it as a timeline. And it's here that we look at major events, some of which of course are devastating events having to do towards the end of the period with quotas at the university, with ghetto benches, segregation, with boycotts. All it, There's a whole story along that timeline. But the big thematic areas are about which of those political movements in the 19th century won out. There was the Bund, the Jewish labor movement, the Aguda, the Orthodox Jewish movement, and of course, Zionism. And culture, Yiddish culture, culture in Hebrew, and Jewish, Jewish participation in, and Jewish, I would say, creative creativity in the Polish language. So that's a story that we tell here. 
Growing up is a story of generational gap. A new generation arises, they go to Polish public schools, the older generation uh, doesn't understand what's going on with them, and it's a story of autonomous Jewish children's play in the courtyard, Jewish school system, um, and the and of course daily life across the length and breadth of Poland, where all those parts of the new Poland had been separated for 120 to 140 years, and now it was time to bring them together to create one Poland. When you walk down the street, you don't see the Holocaust coming. We never, ever anticipate what is going to come next. We try to keep our visitors in the present moment of the story. So when you look down there, what you actually see are people looking up. And it's only, only when you turn the corner that you see what they're looking up at. And it is that the Germans have invaded Poland on September 1st, 1940, 1939. And they're, and from a European point of view, that's the beginning of World War II. From, I think from an American point of view, World War II begins with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But from a European point of view, it begins on September 1st, 1939. And these are bombs falling on Warsaw. We tell the story of the Holocaust within the borders of Poland. That is to say, within the borders of interwar year Poland, not the borders of Poland today, but the borders of Poland in the 1920s and 30s. And we tell this story through primary documents in the first person. That, that, uh, and I just want to show you here. Um, and we tell it not exclusively in terms of the Warsaw Ghetto, but the Warsaw Ghetto is a focal point because we're on the site of the Warsaw Ghetto. And you can see here that the Warsaw Ghetto is in purple and the Jews were crowded into the Warsaw Ghetto where it was more crowded than the per capita, per kilometer that you would have found in Calcutta. It was so, so extraordinary for this very large Jewish community. It was a third of the population of Warsaw was Jewish and they were, collected and forced into the ghetto. Now, the, the the section of the Warsaw Ghetto, which is only a part of the whole story, is based on the Ringelblum archive. On the left is Emanuel Ringelblum, who was a labor Zionist. He kept a diary in Yiddish. He was a social activist. He was an historian. He organized a clandestine archive with about 63 volunteers who in secret recorded everything that was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto and beyond, thanks to couriers who brought their, who brought reports, who brought the underground press, thanks to refugees who arrived, who reported on what they had seen. And, and he is one of our narrators. The other narrator on the right is Adam Chernyakov, who kept a diary in Polish, and he was the head of the Judenrat, the Jewish council, which the Germans had created to run the ghetto and carry out their orders. And he ultimately committed suicide because he refused to choose which Jews would be sent to Treblinka. He simply took a cyanide pill and committed suicide. So they they narrate all the way through. We take quotations from their diary and we narrate all the way through. Now, the archivists, the team, Oynik Shabbos, which means Joy of Sabbath, because they used to meet on Saturday afternoon, they quickly realized that they were not going to survive that during the Great Deportation in the summer of 1942, where 300,000 Jews were deported to Treblinka, they saw that the, 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 it was over. So they wanted to spare the archive. They wanted to save the archive, that if they didn't survive, they had thought they would write a book after the war about the history of the ghetto. But when they saw that their chances of survival were slim, if not impossible, they packed up the archive in tin boxes and then in a second cache in milk cans and they buried it and it's thanks to the recovery of the archive three of them survived and after the war they went out into the rubble and they located the places where the archive was buried and they dug it up and that's the basis that we use for telling the story we look at polish jewish relations during this period and then we come to the post-war years now, many people said that we should have ended the entire story with the Holocaust, because what's there to tell after the Holocaust? 90% of Polish Jews were murdered. 
but there were about 250,000 Jews that either returned or still in Poland after the war. Most of them were survived in the Soviet Union. They were saved by deportation and they returned. About 20,000 were, were saved in, uh, saved themselves in Poland by hiding or by passing as Poles. And another 20, another, another 20,000 came back from the concentration camps. So you can see if 20,000 survived in Poland on the Aryan side, either hiding, hiding in an oak tree, hiding in an empty grave, hiding in sewers, hiding in a, in, in a wardrobe, hiding under the floor of a house, hiding in a barn, 20,000, you can imagine that is not a way to survive. 90% meaning that of the 3,300,000 Jews living in Poland before the war, about 3 million were murdered. So what's the story to tell? Well, there's a big story to tell. It's not about the numbers. The big question was whether to stay or to leave. On one side of this gallery, we tell the story of staying and on the other side of leaving. We tell the story of the creating of the monument and the unveiling of the monument. We also tell the story of post-war violence. The violence in 1946, the Kielce pogrom, of course, is iconic, but there were many other places and many other forms of violence. And we present this again in the first person through primary sources. We also look at the life of Jews who stayed. What was Jewish life like under communism? The forming of the, the dissolution of all independent Jewish organizations and the creating of something called the club, Tes Kajet. And the club was a Jewish space under communism. And what's absolutely fascinating is that during the post-war period, the single, the, the second biggest publisher of Yiddish books was in Poland which that's another story. Then we come to 1968, the anti-Semitic campaign during which of the 20,000 Jews that were still in Poland, about 13,000 left because they were harassed. They were fired from their jobs. It's a longer story. They left on a one-way travel visa. They, their passports were taken away. They weren't allowed to come back. That's all been reversed in recent years, but it was devastating. And so then we had 6,000 Jews left in Poland, and the thought was there will never be a renewal of Jewish life, but there was, and there is, and it's the story of that renewal that we end the core exhibition with. So what I'll do is I like to stop there, and it gives us about 10 minutes for questions, and given this very, very brief walk through the exhibition, I hope that some of your questions will give me a chance to tell you more. Thank you. Um, amazing. So those of you who've seen the museum now understand. It, actually, I don't think you understand because unless you go to the museum, you cannot appreciate what we just saw fully. You can appreciate it because it's amazing and this presentation has been amazing. But to actually walk through the exhibit, that's a different experience. So the first question is, how much time should people take to go? Because I've never had an experience that people didn't want to leave a museum. I mean, we were there for three hours. I don't know what it was. The people wanted to stay. They said, no, we need more time. So when you designed this museum, did you have in mind how much time an average person would have to spend there? Or did you realize what would happen with people saying, oh my gosh, we need to come back. We're spending three or four hours at a museum. That's my first question. Okay, so um, we basically, we think of our visitors falling into three categories. And that is the, uh, let's see, the skimmers, the swimmers, and the divers. The skimmers, we provide for them what we call layer one. And that means, and I have actually taken, you know, I've got VIP visitors, they have no time. I've actually taken them through the whole exhibition in 45 minutes. So that, that, that's for the skimmers. And layer one means that the one big message we wanna communicate, we are communicating it in a very strong and often more general way, but you get the idea. You get the idea in the medieval gallery, you start with one guy, you end up with 15,000. You get the message in the next gallery that, wow, all of a sudden the center of the Jewish world is here. You get the message in the next gallery that Jews created 
a very, very rich everyday life. You get to the, so the idea is, is that the skimmers, they get the overall sense of the story and the overall message and the overall impression. Okay, but then there are the swimmers, the swimmers. So the swimmers, they go to, lo, to layer two. And layer two, they can get more information, but we don't expect them to read every text and watch every video and look at every object and examine every photograph. We expect them to follow their interest, to be selective, to, to do whatever it is. I mean, basically to, 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 to get the overall idea and to swim where they're interested. But the divers, of course, my heart, that the divers are with me. The divers, they want to see everything. They want to explore everything. So I don't know who set the record, but within the first couple of weeks after we opened, one woman came and she came and she reserved a hotel and she spent one day in each gallery. One day in each gallery, but very, very dedicated. There are other divers who will spend the whole day at the museum and who will spend, let's say, the morning in the first half, the afternoon in the second half, you know, come up for lunch in the, in the middle, or they may simply spread their visit out over several days. And so I would say that we think the average visitor will be planning, will be expecting to visit for about two hours. So as a result, we actually created an audio guide that has 90 minutes of audio and allows for a half hour of free exploration. And in that way, for visitors who feel overwhelmed, they're already given a kind of, I would say, certain, like moments that where they can sort of anchor their attention and then the opportunity to take extra time to explore something they're interested in. Maybe they came to an interactive presentation of uh, Polish Jewish dialogue or something to do with the Kabbalah or something else. So that's a that's basically, we think, a two hour visit. But and there are others who actually say, look, I know all about the modern period. I want to visit the medieval and the early modern galleries, the first three galleries. I want to focus on them. You know, I, I, I know all about the Holocaust. I know about the post-war years. So some of them are very selective and they may only visit the parts that they're especially interested in. So the idea was that there are many ways to visit. And we also created thematic guides. You're interested in the story of Yiddish as it's told here. Here is a paper guide of 14 Yiddish moments. You're interested in women. Here are 14 women moments. You're interested in religious life. And, and so there are there's so many ways to visit and and hopefully to visit again and again. That's our goal. Um, yes, it is truly monumental. And I think on our trip to Israel, the goal was to in, to understand 1000 years of Polish history, um, greater Polish history, uh, because most people only focus on that little piece at the end of your museum. The Holocaust piece. It's a major piece. It's a it's a most impactful piece for all of us because that's the piece that we that resonates most with us. But we've captured in the museum was what our goal was on our trip was to appreciate this immense place of Judaism and Jewish history. And yes. that's why it's an amazing museum. So um, if I could just say that one of our goals was also to create an historical narrative that didn't begin with anti-Semitism and end with genocide. And we didn't want to create what I would call a teleological narrative where you know the end from the very beginning and that you see the history as driving inevitably towards that end. So that's why we like to use documents from the period so that you're hearing the voices of people who don't know what's going to come next. And we want our visitors to put themselves in the shoes of not knowing what comes next. So, and we want to place the Holocaust within the thousand year history, rather than treat it as its own event, which of course it also is, and then give you a little bit of background before and give you a little bit of what happened after, and that becomes the whole story. So it's a very different approach. Before I get to the question that that um, is asked about 
who is this museum for? Is it for Jews? Is it for non-Jews? Who has it, and what, the, what, has, what impact has it had, for example, in Polish society, non-Jewish? Um, right. My question to you is, what about the Jews who have this view of Poland and their view is really only because of the Holocaust and what happened? How can they, what, I wonder what their reaction is to this museum because um, it doesn't fit within their worldview. You've, you've basically, exactly what you just were talking about, you've changed the perspective. You said, we can't look at this piece. Let's look at the 1000 years of history. Can, do they come out of this changed people? Do they, are they able to you know, work within the framework that you've built now in this museum? Because it's, it's not their world, world view of Poland, Jewish Poland. That well, is. well, okay. So first of all, one of our, one of our earliest and most loyal distinguished benefactors is a Holocaust survivor from Czechoslovakia, and and he, I mean, he's very he he loves the Polish language. He identifies with Polish culture. He's very Jewish, and in a sense that you know, belongs to a synagogue and identifies very strongly as Jewish. And he's one of our greatest supporters. Now, but I'll give you I'll give you another another example. I mean. I've had I've had people who, for example, said they would never set foot in Poland. Now, some of them will set foot in Germany, beats me, but they'll never set foot in Poland. And then by some set of circumstances, they came and they were absolutely transformed by the experience because it's one thing to, to be far away and say, I know what it's all about. I know what it's like. I'm never going to go there. It's another thing to go there. But I want to give you an example. So. When I was looking for funding for that wooden synagogue project, I thought I'd go to the Azrieli Foundation because David Azrieli, as you probably know, is, was a great, great builder, real estate builder, and a great, great devotee of architecture, who in his late last years of his life actually got a degree in architecture. But he gave express instructions to his daughters. He gave express instructions to his foundation that not a penny of his money should be spent in Poland. So what happened? He got a letter. The letter was from a high school in his hometown. And the high school in the hometown had an assignment to identify famous people from their town. So they must have gone to Wikipedia. They must have gone here or there. Lo and behold, they find the name David Azrieli. They have no idea who he is. They send him a letter. And they say to him, we've, we've just learned that you're from our town. And you're very, very famous. And they, they wrote an incredible letter. Well, the next thing we know, his daughter, who's the head of the foundation, goes to Poland. She goes to his hometown. She goes to the high school. She meets the kids. And then she says to them, we would like to do something for you. Like, we'd like to spend some of my father's money that he said, not a penny of which should be spent in Poland. We would like to do something. What would you like? So the kids said, of course, a swimming pool. But she said, no, 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 no. We're not in swimming pools. We are into, into education. And then, of course, she came to Polling Museum. And we're now collaborating together on translation projects. And I mean, of course, you know, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that each person is going to find, you know, have that experience. But because these experiences are unique. But the answer is that for Holocaust survivors, you have some that come and everything they believe was confirmed. And you have others who come with a certain openness, maybe cautious, skeptical, but open. And then, then they are just absolutely transformed. So, so that's on the Holocaust survivors. I think for Jews, there's a lot of interest in Jew Jewish genealogy and a lot of interest in Jewish roots. And what I like about that project is that it extends to the places where their families came from. So not only like making a tree and seeing how far back you go, but also like, where did my family live? What were their lives like? You know, what were the streets like? What was the marketplace like? You know, what was going on there? Well, I mean, that was my experience with my father. I interviewed him for 40 years and I recorded the interviews. So, so there's a kind of, there's that aspect. Then there's the other aspect, which is that we had no idea about this history. Do you know that in many ways, Poles are more familiar with this history than Jews? If you can imagine such a thing. And I think for Poles, it was a great response. There was one older gentleman who left the museum, who left the exhibition. He said, you know, he said, 
This is a museum of Polish history. That's extraordinary. A museum of Polish history that is not a history of the Polish nation, not a history of the Polish state, but a history of one of the many, many minorities that are part of the historic diversity of Poland. That Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was unbelievably diverse. I mean, every form of Christianity imaginable, like Catholic and Eastern Orthodox and Protestants, every variety of Protestants, and Tatars, Muslims, and Karaites, and Jews, and every variety of Jews as well. You had progressive and Hasidic, and you had you know, assimilated, you had everything. So I think that the that from a Polish perspective, this story is a way to recover the historic diversity that Poland has lost. Because think of it this way. That big red map was when Poland was home to one of the largest Jewish, home to the largest Jewish community in the world, and one of the most diverse communities, perhaps the most diverse in Europe. Poland today, one of the smallest Jewish communities in Europe, in the world, but in Europe, no, let's say in Europe, one of the smallest Jewish communities in Europe, there are smaller ones, and one of the most homogeneous countries because of the effort after the war to create ethnically homogeneous Ukraine, ethnically homogeneous Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland. Now with the influx of Ukrainians, it's really changed the calculus. You know, it's kind of, I would say, introducing something of the historic diversity. So I think from a Polish perspective, it's a Polish story and, and a refreshing one. And a one that is consistent with a much more open, more oriented towards Europe, a much more progressive, democratic way of thinking. So I think it's, well, and I think it's for everyone. There were two young women came and one was from Hawaii and one was from Vietnam. I said, how, how, how did you land here? How did you get to this museum? And they said, well, people told us it was interesting. So they came. You know, it doesn't have to be about you to be interesting. I mean, you would go to a, a wonderful museum that dealt with, let's say, China or that deals with uh, Germany or, it, you know, the assumption that only Jews are interested in Jewish museums. No, other people are interested too. And also they've had, they've experienced genocides also. They've also experienced communism. They've also experienced many things that we present in this history, in this story. So the, the question was, do you keep track of um, who comes to visit? And, in, and if so, who is coming to visit this museum? Of course we keep track, of course. And I waited to hear the question about language, but we'll get there in a minute. So we keep track. So I would say that in the beginning, initially, and it's understandable, I would say that about 70% of the visitors were Polish and about 30% 30, uh, 30 were international and a significant part of that was Jewish and it was divided between Israel and the diaspora. But as time has gone on, during the high season, the tourist season, let's say from March through October, it can be 50-50, 50% -50, 50 Polish, 50% international, 25% Jewish, half Israel, half diaspora. So it really has varied. We also collect visitor responses. We have these cards. I came to the museum because, and then they say, or what I remember most about my experience is. So we have these visitor cards and some of them are really, really interesting. So yes, we do visitor research, visitor surveys. We have a pretty good idea. Hmm. I know we're in overtime, so I'm trying to ask questions really quickly. And I know you have to go, and I appreciate you just staying a little bit longer. But there was a question, the language in the museum. So I was there. I can't remember exactly. I'm pretty sure it was English because I could understand the English. I assume Polish, but I don't know. Tell us about the languages that are on the walls there and how you chose them. And then um, I assume you have uh, guides for all different nationalities as well who come to visit and want to understand in their language. Right. OK, so there was no question that the text had to be in Polish. It's, a, it's in Poland. There was no question the text had to be English, which is the lingua franca of our era, of our day. So th that was beyond question. But then we had heated debates about whether or not there should be texts in Hebrew. 
And then some of us said, well, if in Hebrew, why not in Yiddish? Yiddish is the language that most of these Jews spoke. They, most of them didn't speak Hebrew. They prayed in Hebrew. They studied Hebrew texts. But with uh, just with, except for the Zionists, they, you know, Hebrew was not their, that was not their language, Yiddish. So are we going to have Polish, English, Hebrew, Yiddish? Are we going to have Polish, English, and then choose between Hebrew and Yiddish? Are we going to have wallpaper? Because we're going to have so much text everywhere in all these languages. So we decided better just Polish and English on the wall. But the audio guides were another matter. And that is the first audio guide we did was in Hebrew. So we made the first audio guide in Hebrew. The second audio guide was in Polish. I think there, th th then I think uh, probably English. And then since then, in multitude of other languages. However, I think we are the first and the only museum to have a version of the audio guide, the, the same audio guide, in Yiddish. It is a beauty to behold, well, to hear. It's beautiful. And interestingly, we, at least I, encourage German visitors to take the Yiddish audio guide. Because I think they'll understand most of it. And I think that for them to have a 90-minute experience of the Yiddish language is extraordinary. Extraordinary. Because they can read the text panels. They can read in English. They'll understand a lot of the Yiddish. But for them just to be immersed in the Yiddish language for 90 minutes, why not? That's terrific. Um People asked, what was the total cost for this museum, including the core, and who paid for it? Like, how did you raise the money for this? Okay. Okay. So I think, you know, don't, uh, well, the figures, all right. So far as I know, and don't quote me on this, as they say, I think the building was 110 million and the, was the building 70 million? I think the total project was 110 million. 70 million for the building, 40 million for the core exhibition. Let me put it this way, it's in that ballpark. So, you know, it's not like what, and, and, and you know, that money went a long way in Poland. You could not create this museum in North America for that price. It, it could not be done. It couldn't be done. Now, how did we raise the money? So we had a number of distinguished benefactors who gave us a million or more. And some of whom, one of whom, who made his money developing, who's a mathematician, who made his money developing the algorithm for Lotto is a gambler. So he gambled and he gave us the first million. And he gave it to us really when this was just, just past the dream stage without any assurance, any guarantee, A, that it would happen and B, that it would be fabulous. So then, of course, we had a capital campaign and we got, well, we got, I think, 650,000 £50, pounds from the Rothschild Foundation. Uh, we got money from the German government. Uh, we received money also from the Ministry of Culture, the city of Warsaw, and then from private benefactors. And we did really massive, massive, massive fundraising, uh, mainly in North America, uh, some, a few donors from Israel, a few from Europe. But mainly, um, and I would say that our focus was always on larger gifts because we never had the infrastructure to be able to mount a fundraising gift, a fundraising campaign that could have generated the funds from many, many, many smaller gifts. So that was the approach. Did the Polish government give you money and uh, one, what, uh, one side and you know what percentage? And then was there a lot of politics involved in this museum? Well, what role well, did politics you know, play in this museum? Right. I, you know, I would say that we have to distinguish, you know, the museum was created over a very long period of time. And I think what's extraordinary is that every mayor of Warsaw, no matter what their political party, every mayor of Warsaw has always, always supported and has and is and continues to support the museum. Every mayor of Warsaw, no matter which political party. So I think it's a real jewel 
in Warsaw's crown. And when you look at the most recent, you know, where to go in Europe, and Warsaw was declared the best destination this month. I don't know who will be next month. And what are the three best things to see in Warsaw? Well, believe it or not, the three best things that were in the most recent thing that I saw was the old city, but of course, how could it not be the old city? The Chopin Museum, which is a very sweet, small little museum, and our museum. Three, those are three. So from, I think from the city of Warsaw, like when we opened the building, the mayor of Warsaw invited all the mayors in Europe to come to the opening of the building. So the, there's enormous pride. The feeling is that this is a kind of calling card for Warsaw. It's a calling card for Poland. You know, during the whole brouhaha about the so-called Holocaust bill, when Duda, President Duda went to Israel and he was asked about anti-Semitism, he said, what, what do you mean? He said, look at our beautiful Jewish museum. Now, of course, I don't take that as a good sign because then it's like a fig leaf. You know, it becomes a kind of a, a way to mask what are some very deeper and troubling issues. But it, but it also, also, it is seen as a, a, as a plus. It's seen as a very positive element. So that's, that's, that's on one side. Now, where, the, where, where I would say politics really comes into play, politics really, I would say that in making the core exhibition, of all the ways in which politics could have interfered, we really got off light. I'm not saying there weren't moments, but we got off light. Where politics really come into play are with our temporary exhibitions that take on difficult topics, that take on the March 68 anti-Semitic campaign, for example, or that, uh, that or, well, well, that would be the best, that was the most controversial. And it's, it was, it, it was controversial under the, the current right-wing government because their historical policy is to defend the good name of Poland. And they didn't feel that that event, which was under communism, not under the current government, it was under communism, it was 50 years ago, but they felt that even so, it didn't defend the good name of Poland and they wouldn't support it. But the beauty of our museum is that we did it anyway. And so they wouldn't give us money for it, so we raised the money for it. So what that means is that because we're a private public partnership, the power does not reside wholly in the hands of the Ministry of Culture and or the city, that the private partner, the Jewish NGO, the Association of the Jewish Historical Institute is a partner. It raises money for us. And it, in a sense, is a, I would say, not really a guarantor, but something close to a guarantor for as much independence as we could hope to have. Great. I guess my last question for you today is, uh, you're obviously proud of this and you've worked many years on this and it shows. And again, those of you who've been to the museum know how this museum is different from all other museums. So what is your impact? What has the impact of this museum been on other museums, either existing museums or new museums are being planned? I assume people are coming to you and saying, please share. Um, so tell, tell us or share with us the, well, the ramifications. Well, you know, it's really interesting. I, well, so, of course, I happen to be interested in all kinds of museums. You know, I was on the jury for the European Museum of the Year Award. It was an award that we won in 2016, and then I was invited to join the jury. And invited to join the jury, I got to see museums. You wouldn't believe how many museums I got to see. So, so let me give you a few examples. The uh, Museum of the City of Warsaw, the Warsaw Museum, which is located in the old city, they recently, and of course the old city is completely reconstructed. And it, it's on the UNESCO World Heritage List as a reconstruction because of its defiance of the German efforts to completely demoralize the Polish people by destroying their old city. So it's been reconstructed very meticulously. It's, it's really beautiful. And the reconstruction of it is part of its history. In other words, it's not a fake. It's not an effort to pretend that it's the old city. It is the reconstruction and its power is in the reconstruction. So they anyway, they renovated it. And they created a whole completely new exhibition. And it was the 
not Pauline exhibition. It was that absolutely not. We're not going to be a narrative museum. We're not going to be a multimedia museum. We have a great collection and we're going to find very innovative, very creative and very beautiful ways to use our collection to tell many, many stories about many, many aspects of the city of Warsaw. So, so one reaction is Colleen Museum over my dead body. Absolutely not. The second response is uh, we want one. We 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 want to we we want to do for our story what what you know what you did or my team. I mean, I didn't make the, the exhibition. I led a team, but what the team did for the Pauline Museum. Of course, it'll be different. The third is to I think of as in the same, um, not in the same, but I would say related but different with the Jewish Museum Berlin because they have created a brand new permanent exhibition, brand new, very, very interesting. And in some ways, you know, you'll see similarities, but in other ways, completely radical departures. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's its own thing. Um, but, you know, there are some very, very unique features of our project that I think others won't want to replicate. I mean, our, our, what we call our first person narration, our, our working with this idea of a theater of history, you know, they, our meta historical principles, they actually are pretty unique to this museum and they work together to create a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk. And so in a way it's not repl rec replicable but it can be an inspiration. Amazing. Well, you are an inspiration to all of us. And many of you don't know, but I've been trying for years to get uh, Professor Christian Black Gimblet to join us. So the, the, the beauty of online world, um, CSP and, and accessibility has allowed today's program. What a treat to meet you uh, online and to hear your story. For those of you who were with us and the museum, I'm sure this was an amazing opportunity for you to hear from the person who had it in the, in her head <laughs> and to go see it. Um, it just, the problem is it makes other museums. So, uh, you know, is the word schwach? I don't know, that's, that's the word. So uh, in need of uh, a new vision uh, that this museum is, is special, it's unique. It, it made me proud to be a Jew in Poland. I'm so happy that so many people who aren't Jewish go to this museum and it's a top attraction. There's so much to see, even in a place of destruction uh, around exactly. that area. Um, so on behalf of CSP, thank you for your work. Thank you for being with us today and spending extra time with us. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, I'm going to spend quality time now with my children. And I urge you all to go to the museum. Uh, yes. I assume there's a, I'll share links with everybody. There is a video, a documentary called Raise the Roof, which is about um, the uh, uh, the synagogue uh, roof that's in the museum that you saw that's just dramatically beautiful. I'll share that link. Uh, I'll share a link to the museum online. And I know that, Professor, you're, you're writing a book about this. So uh, hopefully that'll be available. I don't know when, but people can read that. Sooner rather than later. Sooner rather than later. But I really do hope that that people will come and visit. Uh, it's so worth it. Worse is a wonderful city. They're fabulous restaurants, wonderful things to see, wonderful things to do. And, and of course, much to commemorate. So I do, I do very much hope that you'll come. So there you go, you're all invited. You tell them that the professor sent you when you go in the front door, maybe you'll get there like you a VIP, maybe you'll get VIP treatment. I will say the cafe there is very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Everything about the museum is very nice. Uh, very well done, very, very thought out. And thank you for sharing with us today behind the scenes, um, how you did this, how you achieved That's and what you pleasure. were thinking. And I wanna thank you. everybody for being with us today. Have a great day. We'll see you more with CSP. Thank you for supporting us and um, keep learning, everybody. Thank you, you Professor. Bet. We hope to have you back soon. Take care, Thank everybody. Be safe out there. Bye-bye.